Hey guys, welcome back. This is the third part in a five-part lecture series over the endocrine system. Today we're going to be going over the HPT axes and the HPA axes. As we already know, HP means hypothalamic, which is a brain structure, pituitary, which is an endocrine structure, and then the T means thyroid, because the hypothalamus can, communicates with the pituitary gland, the com pituitary gland communicates with the thyroid gland. The A in HPA axis stands for adrenal gland, and again, the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary, the pituitary communicates with the adrenal gland. So we refer to that as an axis because there's a connection there. As always, I've provided a series of learning objectives, so live them, love them, think about them for the exam. Also, definitely have the lecture handout either printed out so you can take uh, notes by hand or available to you in a digital format so you can follow along and think about the questions as we go over the different follow-alongs in the course. So when we think about the regulation of the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is ultimately under control of the hypothalamus. And remember, the hypothalamus is unique because the neurons in the hypothalamus can come into contact with blood and therefore monitor the composition of blood. So the hypothalamus in response to low levels of thyroid hormone, that's what it's monitoring and that's what kicks the system on, produces a hormone called thyroid releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone. All you need to know is the RH, the releasing hormone. If it's releasing or inhibiting hormone, you know it's produced by the hypothalamus. That hormone then travels through the blood vessel network because we're talking about the anterior pituitary gland called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal network. Portal networks are when one capillary network is connected to another. And this hormone, which is a tropic hormone, binds to cells in the anterior pituitary gland, triggering the release of another hormone. Now, the cells that it binds to, the target of the uh, TRH, are actually called thyrotrophs. So those are the cells that ultimately will bind to that hormone and in response that will trigger a pathway in which they release thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is another tropic hormone. It travels through the bloodstream until it gets to the thyroid gland and it will bind to the follicular cells, receptors on the follicular cells of the thyroid gland. It's a peptide hormone. And that binding will trigger the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone will then travel to a broad array of target cells. Thyroid hormone has targets. Essentially, every cell in the body is a target of thyroid hormone for the most part. It'll bind to these target cells, and in general, it will increase metabolism. It will increase or accelerate metabolic rate, the rate at which chemical reactions are taking place, whether it be the breakdown of glucose or the uh, catabolic reactions associated with lipids or the building of proteins, whatever it is. It upregulates metabolism. So it's our primary metabolic regulator, day in, day out, really important hormone. So when we think about the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland sits just inferior to the larynx. The larynx is what we think of as kind of being our voice box. So here's our thyroid gland here, and you get the different lobes of the thyroid gland. Now we're working with a patient, and you're always thinking patient's perspective. So here you have the right lobe, here you have the left lobe of the thyroid gland, and the chunk of thyroid tissue that attaches the two lobes is called the isthmus of the thyroid gland. Now, that's the macroscopic anatomy. All of you can probably identify where the thyroid gland is, and you could probably feel it in your own neck if you kind of knew the anatomy here, and one day you will when you have to perform thyroid examinations. If you look at the histology of the thyroid gland, it's really unique. I don't think it's like bone to me. You can't mistake it with anything else. So the thyroid gland at the histological level is organized into repeating units of what are called follicles. And lining these follicles are simple cuboidal epithelial cells, because that's usually what makes up the secretory portion of glands, and we call these cells follicular cells. So on something like a lab practical, if I was to put a bracket around this entire thing, right, I could ask which organ or what gland did the tissue above come from? It would be the thyroid gland. Or what specific structure was the tissue uh, above extracted from? Then if I put a bracket around this guy and said identify the structure, the entire structure is a follicle. 
if I point it at the cells, right, and remember this is a spherical follicle. We look at it in two dimensions, but it's a sphere, right? It's just cut. If I was to say identify the cells indicated by the pointer, these are follicular cells. So these are follicular cells. And then if I said identify the substance, what sits in uh, the little follicles themselves is a substance called colloid. And these follicular cells, right, and the colloid play an important role in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. So these cells that are not part of follicles are called parafollicular cells, and they secrete a hormone called calcitonin, which has a completely separate function from thyroid hormone. Calcitonin actually plays an important role in the regulation of blood calcium. Nowhere near as important as the parathyroid gland, though, and that's what we're going to be discussing in the next lecture. So <clears throat> if you look at this up close, again, think about identify the organ from which the tissue was taken. Think about a bracket, the asking, identify the structure. Make sure to distinguish if I ask for the cell type, I'm looking for follicular cells. If I ask for the substance, I'm looking for colloid. And the follicular cells in the colloid play an important role in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. Now, when we think about thyroid hormone, again, it has target cells all over the body. All over the body. So there are a few things that I'm going to highlight here because I'm not going to expect you to memorize all of this. Now, note that it's processed or system affected, process or system affected, normal physiological effects, effects of hyposecretion, effects of hypersecretion. So here with the hyposecretion, that's where you're not producing enough. And here with the hypersecretion is where you're producing too much. So the first one I want you to understand is just basal metabolic rate and temperature regulation works on cells all over the body, right? So this one kind of focus on promotes normal oxygen use and basal metabolic rate, which is just how much energy you burn at rest. Calorigenesis, right, which is ultimately burning calories, enhances the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So if you have low levels of thyroid hormone, right, your metabolic rate is going to drop and you're going to feel cold. You're going to put on weight easier. You're going to feel lethargic and fatigued all the time. On the other hand, if you have too much thyroid hormone, hyperthyroidism, you're going to lose weight when you're not trying. You're going to feel hot all the time. You're going to feel awake and agitated. When we come down here to carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism, it promotes the breakdown of different ma macromolecules. It also promotes the buildup of things like proteins. It increases the rate at which those uh, chemical reactions happen. So if you think about the effects of hyposecretion, glucose metabolism drops, cholesterol levels in the body build up because it's not being processed, decreased protein synthesis in key areas, the buildup of fluid, edema, whereas effects of hypersecretion, enhanced breakdown of glucose, proteins, and fats, weight loss, muscle mass loss, everything's in kind of a fine, delicate balance. So when you think about somebody coming into a clinic complaining of symptoms, right, are they consistent with hyposecretion or hypersecretion? Now you can kind of read through that and look at those things. Another one I want to point out because this is where you can kind of see this manifest is on the um, integument. So promotes normal hydration and secretory activity of the skin. In hyposecretion, you'll notice that the skin tends to become pale right? It's thick and it's dry. Uh, there's edema, like pockets of fluid. You get this uh, coarse hair. As opposed to hypersecretion, when the skin's flushed, it's very thin because the cells are turning over really quickly. It's moist. Um, the, the nails uh, change. So kind of look at those three areas and take a look at them. So we know that thyroid hormone plays a major role in regulating our metabolic rate. And when you think about the different conditions or pathologies associated with the thyroid gland or wherever that pathology is stemming from, we can generally break them into a couple of different categories, diseases of hyposecretion and diseases of hypersecretion. So when you think about hypothyroidism, what are some of the symptoms you expect to see? Well, we know that thyroid gland ups the basal metabolic rate. 
So everything that associate, is associated with the slowing down of the metabolic rate is going to be something that you're going to see. So you're going to gain weight. You're going to have poor memory and concentration. You're going to feel lethargic. You're going to feel tired all the time. You're going to feel cold all the time. You're going to want to sleep all the time. And you can go through and kind of look at this set of symptoms, but it's really, it, it makes a lot of sense if you understand the functional role of, thyroid, uh, of the thyroid hormone. Hyperthyroidism, on the other hand, presents in an entirely different way. You lose weight when you don't want to. You feel active all the time. You're irritable. You have trouble sleeping. Your blood sugar skyrockets, right? You feel hot and you want it to be cool wherever you're at. You get little tremors in your hand. A big one is the fat in the eyes starts to wear away so the eyes bulge out. So when you think about that, because we're going to be looking at pathology and lab results, and we're going to use those to determine whether we're talking about primary, secondary endocrine pathologies, but this is going to be a good indicator for the basics. When I give you a clinical scenario, pay attention to how the patient is presenting because you always look at the patient in front of you. Now, when we think about thyroid hormone synthesis, these are follicular cells, and they surround a substance called colloid. Now, the follicular cells in the colloid play a critical role, right, in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. The colloid itself has a lot of very important enzymes that catalyze or allow some of these reactions to take place. You're not going to have to remember all those. Just know that out here, there are a bunch of enzymes that allow these different chemical reactions to take place. Remember, enzymes are little proteins that essentially allow chemical reactions to occur, right? Catabolic, anabolic, doesn't matter. So when we look here, we have thyroglobulin is synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, sent to the Golgi apparatus, and it's ultimately shipped, right, to this guy here. Thyroglobin is really, really important in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. Now, another component that's really important in the synthesis of thyroid hormone is iodide. Iodide always exists in an ionic form, and it's transported into the cells via this iodide transporter. As you're going through this with me, think about that abstract below and think about where the point of interference with the synthesis of thyroid hormone would occur, what type of pathology it is, which we're going to talk about in the next slide, and how it would present on a lab. But that iodide transporter becomes relevant if you read through the, the um, abstract that I've provided for you on your follow along. So iodide is brought into the cell and you have this tyrosine, which is part of the thyroglobin molecule, and there are essentially enzymes that attach either 1-iodine, this is monoiodothyronine, or diiodothyronine, right, meaning 1 or 2 iodines attached. These guys, right, are then shipped back into the cell where they're linked together by enzymes to form either tetra iodothyronine, which we'll call T4, or triiodothyronine, which is T3, right? Lysosomal enzymes then chop these uh, cleave uh, non-functional parts. You get the active hormones that are secreted. It's really important to note here that even though you have T4 and T3, T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone. It's much more active than T4. T4, in fact, in any cell that uh, is a target of thyroid hormone, which is essentially all the cells, will be converted to T3 before it can do anything from a physiological standpoint, before it can trigger any kind of response. So there are some medications like Synthroid, which are T4, right? And other medications, which are T3, they're different potency. They're not equivalent to one another. And in fact, T4 is the preferred um, method of introducing thyroid hormone to the body because the body can handle that a little bit more gradually. You don't get these spikes in thyroid hormone. So T3 is much more active. It's the active form of thyroid hormone. So when you think about mechanisms of action, 
and T3 dissociate from thyroid binding globulin because remember they're lipid soluble so they're being transported throughout the blood by this thing called thyroid binding globulin and if you look at a lab test it says T4 and then T4 free it's measuring the relative concentrations of the bound T4 T3 and then the free T4 T3 which is available for the cells to do work now it's going to enter directly into the cells but T4 is always going to be converted to T3. If it's T3, it's just going to enter into the cell and do what it has to do. So it's much, it's mo much more potent than T4. If it's T4, it's going to enter into the cell, but it's going to be converted to T3 by enzymes in the cell membrane. So T3 is going to enter into the nucleus, and it's going to bind to an intracellular receptor where it's going to change right, gene expression. Are you producing proteins? Remember that if you activate a gene, a gene is information for making a protein. So maybe you're activating a protein that breaks glucose down, an enzyme that breaks uh, glucose down or is important in the, in the uh, metabolic pathway that glucose is burned. Or maybe you're activating an enzyme that breaks down lipids or you're activating a, a key enzymes in the synthesis of muscle proteins or whatever it is, right? So... Proteins are produced in response, and in general, it's going to increase the metabolic rate of the cell. It's going to increase the rate at which the cell utilizes energy and does whatever it's doing. It's a, it up ratchets the system. <clears throat> so when we think about clinical pathology, when you're looking at labs specifically associated with either the thyroid gland or the adrenal glands, right, one of the first questions you're always going to ask is, are we dealing with a primary endocrine disorder? Primary endocrine disorders stem directly from the endocrine gland. Or are we dealing with a secondary endocrine disorder? Secondary endocrine disorders stem from somewhere other than the gland that's producing the active hormone. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it stems from the HP axis, meaning the problem is either in the hypothalamus or pituitary gland. So a secondary disorder is not necessarily better, and in fact, oftentimes is worse because you don't want problems in your brain or in your primary, you know, regulatory endocrine structure, the pituitary gland. You don't want a tumor there, for example. So that's one of the first questions we ask. Do we have a primary or a secondary endocrine disorder? Now, when you think about that, you're going to see lab results. And whenever you look at a lab result, you're always going to have the test that's being performed. You're going to have the patient's value. So the result here is indicative of the patient's value. And then you're going to have a reference interval, meaning this is what it should be. And oftentimes, the lab itself will flag anything that falls outside of that reference range, and the physiological set point often exists right in the middle of that reference range. So this is thyroid-stimulating hormone. This is bound T4, meaning bound to that protein that transports it through the blood because it's uh, lipid-soluble. This is free T4. This is T3, which is the active form of the hormone, and... Uh, is a lot more potent than T4, so we pay close attention to this one, but we look at it holistically. Now, antithyroglobin antibody and antithyroid peroxidase antibody are antibodies that are produced that target and destroy the thyroid gland. They're indicative, if they're elevated, of what's called an autoimmune disease. In other words, if the immune system begins to recognize the thyroid gland as a threat or part of non-self, those white blood cells are going to start to produce antibodies, and those antibodies are going to attach to and trigger an immune response that's going to begin to destroy the thyroid gland. So these are really important measures down here, these antibodies, because they're antibodies that the body produces that target the thyroid gland specifically. And if those are elevated and these values are off, then that might be another indicator as to what you're looking at, something like an autoimmune disease. So... Let's focus on this pathway over here as we go through these results. So I'm going to put up some oh, I'm going to put up some practice results here. Now the numbers have changed. So you look at your patient value and you go 15. 15 is really high, so thyroid stimulating hormone is really high. 
right? That means the anterior pituitary is cranking out thyroid stimulating hormone. So we come down here to our thyroid hormone and we see that across the board thyroid hormone levels are low. So the anterior pituitary gland, the, the HP axis, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland are working fine. They're detecting low levels of thyroid hormone and the hypothalamus is telling the anterior pituitary in response to low levels of thyroid hormone, hey, release TSH, release TSH. Because there's no thyroid hormone, we need thyroid hormone. Start producing it and release it. So thyroid stimulating hormone has increased but at the level of the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland isn't doing its job, right? And we don't know why it's not doing its job, but it's not doing its job. So whenever you see this, and frankly, whenever you see that the thyroid stimulating hormone is at the opposite end from the actual thyroid hormone, that's always going to be a primary disorder. The hypothalamus and anterior pituitary are working fine. It's the thyroid gland. So that would be considered a primary endocrine disorder because whatever the problem is here, it is stemming directly from the thyroid gland. So you go, okay, this is a problem with the thyroid gland directly, right? The thyroid gland isn't responding to the TSH. Now we're going to figure out why. So we know this problem stemming from the thyroid gland. What could potentially be the issue? Well, if you remember back to here, one of the key elements in making thyroid hormone is iodide. You get iodine in the diet. In fact, many of the salts you probably use on your food are, you, you know, have iodine added. So you don't see iodine deficiency a lot here. But if iodine's deficient, right, thyroid stimulating hormone is going to come down and it's going to stimulate these follicular cells to continue producing thyroglobulin in anticipation of producing more thyroid hormone because thyroid hormone levels are so low. As a consequence of that, these follicles are going to grow. The thyroid gland is actually going to grow. So with a patient like this, you'd probably do another test to see if they're deficient in iodine, and in fact, that's probably going to be the case. And what you get is what's called a goiter, because that thyroid stimulating hormone is constantly telling the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. Those follicles get bigger, right, because they're constantly cranking out thyroglobulin. It would be like a, a car factory that you're telling, hey, make cars, and they're making the bodies for cars, but they don't have any tires, the tires are kind of like the iodine. They're the key component to make the car work. So they're just building up bodies and then need more space to build up those bodies, but they don't have the key component to make the car actually work. Kind of the same thing here. You're building up that thyroglobulin, but you don't have any iodine, right? So you can't attach those iodine molecules and those are, or iodide ions, and those are critical components of thyroid hormone. So the thyroid gland grows. So you look at the patient as a whole, you go, okay, that's a primary disorder. It's stemming from the thyroid gland. What's going on with the thyroid gland? Well, this person may not be getting enough iodine in their diet. You do the diagnostic. You see that the iodine levels are low or iodide levels are low. And you go, okay, then how do you treat this? Well, you, you give them iodine, right? You supplement iodine in their diet in some way, shape, or form, and there are different mechanisms to do that. It's uh, not as complicated to correct an issue like that as it is an issue stemming from, for example, the brain or the pituitary gland. Now, let's take a look and let's alter the lab values like this. So now we see that TSH is high and that thyroid hormone levels are low. Whenever thyroid stimulating hormone is opposite from what's going on with the, thyroid, the different uh, variants of thyroid hormone, you always know that that's gonna be a primary pathology. It's gonna be stemming from the gland directly because the hypothalamus and pituitary gland are doing their job here. In fact, primary disorders are so much more prevalent that oftentimes to monitor somebody's thyroid health, a, for example, primary care physician will just look for TSH. A specialist won't. A specialist will run the entire diagnostic like an endocrinologist. But uh, a primary care physician might just do TSH to see if it's elevated. 
right? So you get the elevated TSH, meaning the hypothalamus and pituitary gland are working, and then you see the thyroid hormone level is low, so the thyroid gland isn't doing its job and cranking out thyroid hormone. So this would be a primary endocrine pathology. It would be a disease like the last time of hyposecretion. This would be hypothyroidism. And you look down here at these other commonly run diagnostics whenever you're working with the thyroid and you see that these antibody levels are elevated. That means the immune system is launching an attack on the thyroid gland. And all of this put together, you go, this person has hypothyroidism. The immune system is launching an attack on the thyroid gland. When you see this patient, you would expect them to be cold, tired, lethargic, mentally not quite as sharp. Uh, you know, with the thinning hair and the uh, fatigue and all of the different the weight gain, right? All of the different things you'd associate with a low basal metabolic rate. This would probably be more indicative of something like an autoimmune disease such as Hashimoto's disease. And Hashimoto's disease is very, very common. I think 50 million Americans may suffer from Hashimoto's disease. It's a very, very common disorder. So Hashimoto's disease, super duper common. Again, you can identify that on the labs, and I want you to be able to justify why you're saying, uh, why you're making the diagnosis you are. So I kind of put you through it in a stepwise way as you're going through those diagnostic labs. Now let's look at something else. So now we have a result where TSH is really low. So you go, oh my God, TSH is really low. Now, the TSH is opposite <clears throat> from the thyroid hormone. So TSH is really low because thyroid hormone levels are really high across the board. And remember, when thyroid levels get thyroid hormone levels get high, it shuts off the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. It shuts off this pathway because you don't want any more thyroid hormone if thyroid hormone levels are already elevated. So this pathway shuts off, and that's what you're seeing reflected here. So in this case, the thyroid gland is producing a huge amount of thyroid hormone, even though it's not being told to. It should only do what it's being told to do by the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, but it's not doing what it's being told to do. There's hardly any thyroid stimulating hormone, yet thyroid hormone levels are through the roof. So that's a primary endocrine pathology. You know that it's stemming from the thyroid gland directly. So you go, okay, problem stemming from the thyroid gland. We now have not a disease of hyposecretion, but a disease of hypersecretion. This is what we would think of as being hyperthyroidism. And with all the signs and symptoms that follow, feeling hot all the time, awake, agitated, trouble sleeping, losing weight, bulging eyes, because the fat that locks your eyes into the socket starts to get eaten away because that metabolic rate is cranked up all the time. So you go, this is a disease of hypersecretion. It would be hyperthyroidism. And you start thinking about what could potentially cause this disease. Well, one of the most common causes of hyperthyroidism is a disease called Graves' disease. And in Graves' disease, the immune system produces antibodies that don't destroy the follicular cells in the thyroid gland, but rather they bind to the receptor that thyroid stimulating hormone usually does, and it triggers these cells to start releasing thyroid hormone. It upregulates the synthesis and release of thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone level elevations, you get increased metabolic rate across the board. As metabolic rate increases, the breakdown of fat increases. The fat that locks your eyes into the socket starts to break down, so your eyes kind of bulge out. You start to lose weight. You feel hot. You're anxious all the time. You're Trevor. You, you know, your hands shake because you're so jacked up because you have so much thyroid hormone. So this would be indicative of something like Graves' disease, right, which is going to have a different treatment. It's going to have a different treatment. So now let's look at a different situation. Now, what we got going on is a situation in which thyroid stimulating hormone is low and all of the thyroid hormones are low across the board. So now, right, we go, well, the thyroid gland is just doing what it's supposed to. It's not being told to produce a lot of thyroid hormone. Right? It's got to get that message to produce a lot of thyroid hormones. So the thyroid gland is doing fine. Right? 
The problem is, is that there's very low concentrations of thyroid hormone, so why is the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary not doing their job? So whenever thyroid stimulating hormone level is low and thyroid hormone is low, or if it's high and thyroid hormone is high, then you know you're dealing with a secondary endocrine pathology, and secondary endocrine pathologies associated with this pathway often stem from the hypothalamus or the pituitary. What happens in cases like this is it could be something like a tumor in that area. But the problem is, right, a tumor, you could be taking a medication that's interfering with the way that thyroid hormone is being processed, whatever it is, but you know that it's stemming from these guys, and that becomes more problematic. Then you do an MRI, and you hope that it's not an advanced aggressive tumor. You hope that it's uh, something that's treatable, right, uh, uh, um, causing that dysregulation. You'd see the same signs and symptoms, but now the cause the area where the problem is taking place is different. So when you think of drugs that suppress thyroid stimulating hormone and their proposed mechanisms of action, one of the things I want you to get in the habit of always asking any patient is what medications are you taking? Because anything, right? When you as we see, you know, throughout these lectures, you have interconnected networks of communication among different organ systems. And anything that interferes with one or modifies one pathway could modify another. So you look and you go, well, these medications are associated with uh, changes in the way that thyroid hormone is processed. So it could be changes in TSH. It could be changes in thyroid hormone directly, like many antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, cardiac medications, right, interfere with the way that thyroid hormone is processed at the level of the thyroid gland. Always ask, what medications are you on? Because that's a really important thing to know. Now, we've talked about the, the follicles. We've talked about the colloid. We've gone through the pathway of the synthesis of thyroid hormone, etc. We've talked about the regulation of the thyroid gland and how to recognize diagnostics. The next group of tissue or cells we're going to talk about are the parafollicular cells. And the parafollicular cells are responsible for releasing a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin is nowhere near as important as parathyroid hormone, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture. But when you think about calcitonin, what is the stimulus for calcitonin release? So now we're going, okay, when calcium levels get too high, right, so calcium levels are elevated, and you see this on something like a chem panel, and you're looking at those electrolyte concentrations, when calcium levels get too high, right, that's detected, the receptor are the uh, <clears throat> parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland. They're the control center. They process that information, and they release an effector, calcitonin. That effector then has target cells specifically in the bone, and what they do is they decrease the activity of osteoclasts. So they slow down the activity of osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are cells that break bone down and release the components of bone, the mineral components like the calcium and the phosphorus into the blood. When you slow down the osteoclasts, blood calcium levels fall, homeostasis is restored. Remember the stimulus and the response are opposite of one another. This is a negative feedback pathway. Now elevated blood calcium levels are nowhere near as problematic as low blood calcium levels because the heart is very sensitive to calcium fluctuations. So when you think about um, these pathways, what we're going to be focusing on in the next lecture is the parathyroid glands, but for today we're focusing on the... So now we're going to start looking at the HPA axes, which stands for hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axes because the hypothalamus and pituitary gland exert overriding control over much of the adrenal function as well. There are tiers of control and then negative feedback mechanisms that allow for tighter regulation of the gland. So when we look at the adrenal gland, they are these glands that sit on top of the kidney and they're broken into two major functional regions. You have the adrenal cortex, which is the outer region of the gland, and you have the adrenal medulla, which is the inner region of the gland. 
The adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla are structurally and functionally unique, so being able to distinguish between the two is going to be important because I could put a bracket that just says identify the major region, identify the major region, and there I'd just be looking for adrenal cortex or adrenal medulla. Now the adrenal cortex is broken into a series of layers. If I was going to, whoa, if I was going to ask you about one of these layers, I would ask you to identify the specific layer indicated by the bracket, and they, that might be a good indicator that at that point I'm talking about the adrenal uh, cortex. So if we look here at the adrenal glands from a histological standpoint, you have this capsule. This capsule is made from dense irregular connective tissue, and it kind of stabilizes the internal soft tissue of the gland itself. Then you have the most superficial layer, which is the zona glomulorosa. The zona glomulorosa consists of these spherical cells that produce a steroid hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone is very important in fluid and electrolyte balance. Essentially what it does is it triggers the elimination of potassium and the reabsorption of sodium and water, and without it you would die. Right, Aldosterone is a crazy important hormone, but we're not going to talk much about aldosterone today. We're going to focus on, on aldosterone, which is known as a mineralocorticoid, meaning that it's a steroid hormone that uh, regulates mineral balance, electrolyte balance. We're going to talk about it at a later time point when we get to fluid and electrolyte balance. What we're going to focus on more today is the zona fasciculata. Now, the zona fasciculata, the cells organize themselves into these lipid-rich cords, right? So you have all these cells that kind of organize themselves into these lipid-rich cords. And these lipid-rich cords, to me, look kind of like bubble wrap. They stain really light because lipids don't pick up stain really well, and it looks kind of like bubble wrap. And what the zona fasciculata produces are a class of hormones called glucocorticoids, the most important of which is cortisol by a long shot. So a lot of our discussion today is going to be centered on cortisol. Now, the deepest layer of the cortex is called the zona reticularis. The zona reticularis is responsible for producing uh, the precursor of sex uh, steroid hormones, so you can think of them as being androgens. Androgens are male hormones, but not everything that's produced here turns into a male hormone. So for example, the zona reticularis produces the precursor to testosterone, but that testosterone is then converted to testosterone in the testes or other tissues in the body. So when you think about where women get testosterone, they get some of their testosterone from the ovaries and some of their testosterone from the adrenal glands, right? You don't think about testosterone being really important in women, but women, just like men, need a certain amount of testosterone. And sometimes women will go, you know, to a doctor complaining of lack of libido, you know, muscle weakness, and they can link it to things like testosterone. So it's not just men who are on testosterone therapy, it's women as well. So androgens think testosterone. But the zona reticularis also produces a precursor to both estrogen and testosterone called DHE. And after menopause, DHEA can be converted not only by the ovaries but by other tissues in the body to estrogen, and it also has weak estrogen effects itself. So that's where most of the estrogen ultimately stems from. You get this precursor, and then it's converted elsewhere in the body, and it also has weak estrogen effects. So there's your adrenal cortex. In the adrenal medulla, on the other hand, you get the production of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those are called your catecholamines. And epinephrine and norepinephrine are adrenaline. And we're going to talk about that when we wrap up today and we talk about acute versus chronic stress. So, okay, so now let's talk about mind-body connection. So our focal point for this particular lecture is going to be on the zona fasciculata and the release of cortisol. So let's look at how cortisol uh, regulation occurs. So here we have the brain, and this is the prefrontal cortex, which is where kind of higher order thinking, such as executive function, decision making, reasoning, abstract thought, imagination, right, are largely stemming from. Not entirely, but largely. Hippocampus associated with memory, amygdala associated with tying an emotional state to a specific stimuli. 
So let's say you're stressed in some way. For example, a boyfriend or a girlfriend breaks up with you or you're told you have to take an anatomy and physiology exam. That information makes its way in the brain and it goes to the prefrontal cortex and prefrontal cortex communicates with the hippocampus and goes, ooh, we may want to store this in our long-term memory. There's also communication networks among the amygdala and the amygdala goes, ah, oh, that's super stressful, dude. The amygdala then feeds that stress signal out to every region of the brain because it wants to prep the brain for some kind of stressful event. One of the regions associated with the limbic system that the amygdala communicates with is the hypothalamus. And remember, the limbic system is the emotional brain, and the, the amygdala is kind of the centerpiece of the limbic system because it applies an emotional uh, quality to stimuli. What I mean when I say that is it tells you, is that scary? Is that happy? Is that sad? What, what's going on from an emotional perspective? So the amygdala then feeds that information to the hypothalamus, that information associated with stress in the hypothalamus releases CRH, which is cortotropin releasing hormone, travels through the hypothalamic hypophysial portal network, that hormone, which is a tropic hormone, binds to cells in the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary releases ACTH, ACTH then travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex where it binds to the cells in the zona fasciculata and it triggers the release of cortisol. Cortisol is your body's long-term or chronic stress hormone. So when I talk about mind-body connection, I'm saying the activity in your mind that you think is relegated to your brain, the thoughts you're having, they're not relegated to the brain because the mind and the body are connected. So the thoughts you're having aren't only disturbing you from a psychological level, but they have shifted the chemistry of your body, right? The chemistry of your body has completely changed. So cortisol has a wide array of functions. There's two that I want you to remember for the exam. Cortisol suppresses immune function because if you're in a chronic stress situation, we don't want the cell upkeep. We don't want to dedicate metabolic resources to things like inflammation. We want to be able to move and survive, right? So that's good in the short run. In the long run, that's really, really bad. So cortisol suppresses the immune system and it jacks up blood glucose levels. So it jacks up your blood sugar, suppresses the immune system. So if you look, if you Google uh, signs and symptoms of stress, right, you'll see things like the increased, you know, uh, accumulation of adipose tissue. You'll just get fat forming all over the place because you have this sugar floating around all the time and your cells have to store that sugar somewhere so it gets stored as fat. Increased blood pressure, metabolic syndrome across the board, uh, metabolic dysregulation, susceptibility to infection and cancer, right? All of these things that stem from that increase in glucose and the suppressed immune function, it's the reason why students are more susceptible to illness after taking an exam or finals. It's because they've had cortisol floating around suppressing their immune response for so long. And there's a great book about this particular pathway called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Essentially what happens with zebras is a lion will chase them and the zebra will get a burst of epinephrine and cortisol and it'll run away. And then five minutes later, those levels return back to normal because the zebra doesn't sit there and ruminate on the potentials of having a lion come and chase them tomorrow. They're just like, oh, somebody got eaten, I'm going to eat grass, right? Humans, on the other hand, worry. And we create these uh, almost pathological cycles of worry that constantly release cortisol. So we're constantly suppressing our immune response and jacking up our blood glucose. And then you get the downstream consequences from that. So, you know, there was a very interesting set of studies that came out of Harvard called the meditation studies that looked at cortisol as a marker of stress. And just taking a few moments every day to just kind of clear your mind and calm down can have dramatic effects, not only on your psychological well-being, but on your metabolic health as a whole. So when you think about the release of cortisol, you have stress. CRH triggers anterior pituitary to release ACTH. ACTH triggers the adrenal cortex, specifically the cells in the zona fasciculata to release cortisol. Cortisol is your body's stress hormone, suppresses the immune system, jacks up blood glucose levels. 
there's a negative feedback. When cortisol levels get too high, it should shut down these pathways, right? So it should shut these down, but that's not always the case as we saw with thyroid hormone. So when you look at the diurnal, which means daily cortisol levels, hormone levels wax and wane throughout the day. You tend to get spikes in certain parts of the day, drops in other parts of the day. Cortisol levels tend to spike when you wake up. So right when you wake up in the morning, that's when you should have the highest levels of cortisol. And you can see this is high, this is low, and we're going to talk about uh, the hypercortisolemia and hypocortisolemia. But when you look at this, this is normal right here, right? But we're going to have pathologies where these are elevated or depressed. And we just talked about one, right, which is stress. Chronic stress can produce elevations in cortisol. And they tend to drop throughout the day, and they tend to be lowest when you're in the deepest phase of sleep. So there's a rhythm to the cortisol release. So the time of day you get cortisol is going to dramatically, if you're doing like a lab test, is going to dramatically influence the concentration. Now, one of the things we always care about whenever we're looking at a disorder, is it primary? Is it stemming from the adrenal gland itself or is it secondary? Is it stemming from somewhere else, notably like the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland? Not always, but notably. So you get, the, you get your lab test and you see your reference range, which is what it should be, right? This is the high end, this is the low end, but in between there, that's fine in most cases, right? And you look and you see the patient value. So the patient value of cortisol, the active hormone, is elevated. You know right off the bat, right, and you're always looking at the active hormone, by the way. You never look at the precursor tropic hormones. You look at the active hormone to define whether it's a disease of hyper or hyposecretion. So this is a disease of hypersecretion because the active hormone level is high. So you go, ooh, cortisol levels are elevated. Now... They're elevated because the adrenal cortex is being told to do that. ACTH levels are also high. So the adrenal gland is just doing what it's told. So you know the problem isn't stemming from the adrenal gland. The problem is stemming from one of these two structures. So this isn't a primary endocrine pathology. This is a secondary endocrine pathology. That's not good, by the way, right? Then you go, oh, I wonder what's going on. Let's put this person under the MRI. So Cushing's disease is a disease where you have too much cortisol cranking through you. And you'll notice this person's progression in Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is a disease of hypersecretion in which you have too much cortisol. And you'll notice that she put on a ton of weight. Her blood pressure probably rose. She was probably pre-diabetic, right? And what Cushing's disease is, is actually it stems from a tumor that grows on the pituitary gland that starts releasing or triggering the release of, of ACTH all the time, right? It's just constant release. And in that case, you actually have to remove the pituitary tumor. So you see the six months post, and I didn't spell that, the pet-tuitary, she probably sounded it out, which is fine with me, right? And then... 7.5 years later, because she's probably working with an endocrinologist and she's getting healthier. So that would be a primary endocrine pathology. A really common one is this Cushing's disease, and you tend to get this hump back and this accumulation of fat and, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, or just overt diabetes, etc., because you think about what cortisol does and it makes a lot of sense. Now let's look at the same axis and look at a different set of lab values. So now we have our test, reference range, patient value, and we're looking at cortisol and we go, whoa, cortisol is really, really low, right? So you go, I wonder if that's stemming from the gland or from the central networks that control this, the hypothalamus or the pituitary. So you look at ACTH, ACTH is really high. So the hypothalamus and pituitary are recognizing that there's low levels of cortisol, and in response to that, they're going, hey, adrenal gland, release cortisol, where the problem is here is at the adrenal gland. So this would be considered a primary endocrine pathology. This would be considered a primary endocrine pathology. The gland isn't doing what it's supposed to do. So you think about the potential causes of that. This is where you get something called Addison's disease. 
So you get hypoglycemia, meaning blood sugar levels drop really low because cortisol plays an important role in regulating blood sugar levels along with other hormones. It works with other hormones. Blood pressure drops, weight loss, your diarrhea, GI tract, you feel weak all the time. And this is a really, really dangerous one, right? So it could be a tumor on the adrenal gland itself. It could be adrenal fatigue. The adrenal gland just isn't working. And this happens. So this disease specifically is called Addison's disease. Now, whereas cortisol is associated with prolonged stress, we tend to think of it as our chronic stress hormone, epinephrine and norepinephrine are kind of short-term responses. This is when the sympathetic nervous system activates, and there is a component of the endocrine system in the sympathetic nervous system. So remember the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight system. Now the sympathetic nervous system is mediated entirely by spinal nerves, but these spinal nerves are under the control, either directly or indirectly, of nuclei in the hypothalamus. Either the hypothalamus is going to influence the brainstem, which is going to influence the neurons in the lateral gray horn of the um, thoracic segments of the spinal cord, or it's going to be direct. Now, let's say there's a stressor, right? Like you um, have a fight or you're going to be in a fight tomorrow or something. If you're about or, or you're, go, you're about to get into a fight, when you're about to get into a fight, both of these pathways activate, but the one that activates much quicker is the sympathetic nervous system. So the immediate dilation of the pupils and amping up is a nervous system response, but the nervous system response is augmented by the endocrine system. So essentially, the sympathetic nervous system activates and these preganglionic sympathetic motor neurons extend out, right? And they extend all the way to the adrenal medulla with these cells called chromaffin cells. And when the sympathetic nervous system activates, it triggers the adrenal medulla to release two hormones called your catecholamines, which are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, whereas the nervous system component of the sympathetic response is immediate, right? It's really quick. It happens very quickly. The endocrine portion of the sympathetic response takes a little bit of time, but it activates everything. So it takes a little bit of time, but it activates everything, right? So, and it's going to keep that activated for a longer period of time. The nervous system, remember, has really short duration. The endocrine system, on the other hand, has a really long duration. So if you've ever been, like, let's say, in an argument with your significant other or uh, in an altercation in traffic and you're really amped up, that's your sympathetic nervous system. But notice that you stay amped for a while. You don't get into a, an argument with your significant other and then two seconds later you're like, I'm good, I'm cool. A lot of times you sit there stewing and you have trouble sleeping and you're pissed off and right? You're awake the whole time. It's because you have adrenaline pumping through your blood, right? Or if you, you, you know, have an altercation with somebody, it takes a while to calm down after that because you have adrenaline pumping through your blood. Or you have a kid who has a temper tantrum or runs into something scary and they're inconsolable for a longer period of time. It's because their sympathetic nervous system is activated, but they have epinephrine and norepinephrine pumping through their blood. Um, if you exercise at night, one of the things sleep specialists will do if you have trouble sleeping is they'll say, don't exercise at night because you don't want that spike of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Different people have different tendencies and, and um, sensitivities to it. So some people work out at night just fine, but it's one of those things. And what it's going to do is it's going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, increase blood glucose because you want to have readily available glucose reserves if you're about to engage in some kind of physical activity dilate the bronchioles in the lungs because you're going to want to be able to pull more oxygen in and it's going to increase your metabolic rate across the board, dilate your pupils, etc. So <clears throat> this is augmenting or reinforcing the initial nervous system component of the sympathetic response and it's activating everything for a longer period of time, right? So you can engage in uh, rigorous physical activity for a longer period. The release of cortisol, on the other hand, is a long-term stress response, right? 
So I kind of want to compare those in a different diagram. I want you to see what we're kind of talking about here. So when you think of the effects of adrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine, on the heart, adrenaline is going to bind to what are called beta-1 adrenergic receptors, which you should be familiar with. And it's going to increase heart rate, and it's also going to increase the contractile force of the heart. In the lungs, you're going to get bronchodilation via beta-2 receptors in the smooth muscle of the lining of the respiratory tract, so it's going to pull in more air, so you can pull in more air. So your heart's going to be beating faster, moving more blood around your body. Your lungs are going to, uh, the bronchi in the lungs are going to dilate, so you can bring more air in. One of the things I want to highlight here is that you have beta-1 receptors in the heart and beta-2 receptors in the lungs. Now, why do we want to know about adrenaline and what it does? Well, when you think about the training that you're going to have as nurses, you're going to go through what's called uh, code training. You're going to have to take like pediatric advanced life support, and you're going to have to understand how we apply this knowledge to real world situations. So when you're thinking about uh, cardiopulmonary respiration, one of the first questions that you ask in an AED, an automated external defibrillator, can distinguish this is do you have a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm? If you have a shockable rhythm, you're going to shock and then continue CPR. If you have a non-shockable rhythm, you're going to continue CPR and you're going to run epinephrine right before the shock. You don't ever inject epinephrine directly into the heart because somebody with a little black medical book told you to, right? You don't like stab it into the heart like this scene always cracks me up because you don't do that. You run it via an IV or you run it into the bone and if you're performing good chest compressions, that's going to move that epinephrine through the body and it's going to get to the heart within a minute. You don't have to stab the heart directly. In fact, that would be a piss poor way to get epinephrine into the heart right? Because it wouldn't diffuse into any of the blood vessel networks. So it'd just be one localized lump of epinephrine. You just you don't stab it directly into the heart. You run it via an IV. So you'll notice, anyway, you'd probably have an IV of epinephrine and you'd be pumping. But what it does is it can actually kind of kickstart the heart, right? Can correct the rhythm and it can actually activate those uh, sympathetic pathways and um, potentially be very useful, and that's why it's used in things like coding situations. So when you think about short-term stress, right, you recognize that there's a fire going on, and this is just the weirdest image. You recognize there's a fire going on. Hypothalamus controls the sympathetic response. The sympathetic nervous system response is mediated entirely by spinal nerves that stem from the lateral gray horn of the uh, thoracic segments of the spinal cord. You have your preganglionic neuron, which fires an action potential, right? Travels along the spinal nerve, tells the adrenal medulla to produce epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are essentially adrenaline. That's going to immediately increase heart rate, blood pressure. It's going to dilate the bronchi so you can bring more air into the lung. So a lot of asthmatics will actually feel better after they exercise because the nervous system has done the work of dilating their bronchi. And it's going to increase uh, blood glucose levels because you want energy reserves available for those skeletal muscles if you're going somewhere. Now, again, you don't want this happening all the time, right? The stress response. Most of your day should be spent in parasympathetic tone meaning you should be in the rest and digest mode for most of your day, right? But it, this is a very useful set of things. What the hormone does is it augments the nervous system effects. So whereas the nervous system effects are immediate, the hormone floats around for a longer period of time and it reinforces those and it allows the system to be activated for a longer period of time. That's why it's hard to calm down after you engage in some kind of like really rigorous physical activity or you had a real threat to your uh, well-being. Chronic stress, on the other hand, is where we tend to see cortisol be the primary um, pathway. So, for example, if you're living on the streets and you don't know where your next meal is coming from and, you know, you may have a psychiatric issue or whatever is going on, that's really tough. And that's a real stressor, by the way, but it's, you don't ever want chronic stress or long-term stress, right? So that's going to trigger those pathways we talked about, the release of ACTH to the adrenal cortex, the release of cortisol. Cortisol is going to suppress immune function. It's going to uh, 
So it's going to suppress immune function, jack up blood glucose levels, and it's going to make you more prone to a lot of different metabolic diseases. Um, so yeah, 